All right. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker is Jimmy Faulkner from the Yurok tribe. He'll be talking about measurements of dissolved oxygen in beaver dam analogs and jubile, juvenile coho salmon productivity metrics. Jimmy, you can go ahead and share your screen. Hey, can you see the screen? I can, this is great, thank you. Okay, morning everyone. And today I'll be talking about some data that we've collected in relation to two beaver dam analogs that we installed in the West Fork of McGarvey Creek. Just a little bit of orientation of where McGarvey Creek is. It's about 9.5 kilometers upstream from the Klamath River mouth. And then in the presentation, I'll be talking about a couple of different reaches of McGarvey Creek. The first reach is this Lower McGarvey. And it starts from the confluence with Klamath River and extends up to this orangish dot there that I have. And then Upper McGarvey Creek goes from that orange dot to that black dot up there. And then this other tributary that we have over here is the West Fork of McGarvey Creek. And this is where in, we installed the BDAs. And those are the approximate locations of those BDAs, which is down in, in the lower end of the West Fork. These pictures are just kind of give an idea of the, the tributary we're talking about. It's not a big tributary. That's kind of a typical winter flow. And then over here on the right is a picture. Some of that flow is going underneath the dam, but flows get really low in the summer. The West Fork never goes completely dry, but the flows can get, get uh, very low, especially during dry years. And if I was to guess, I'd guess about a quarter CFS is what that low base flow is. Also why we selected the, the West Fork of McGarvey Creek to build these BDAs as a, an area to relocate juvenile coho salmon, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But the West Fork doesn't have a lot of spawning in it. So there's vacant habitat up here where we can relocate fish and they won't necessarily compete with uh, fish rearing in, in other locations that, that stay wetted like Upper McGarvey Creek. So this, this lower section of McGarvey Creek does experience channel drying in, in the pattern, especially in this drought that we've been in for, for quite a while, starting in you know, that 13, 14 year. The, the, Channel drying seems to be getting worse. It's been observed by people that have worked in the watershed for, for longer than I have that this pattern of channel drying is seemingly getting worse. And also that about 40% of the juvenile coho habitat during, during droughts or real dry years is going dry in McGarvey Creek. So as a result of this, long before I got here even, but we've been doing relocation efforts where we relocate not only juvenile coho salmon, but we're also relocating any species we encounter, which include steelhead cutthroat, stickleback, uh, small scale suckers, and uh, also speckled dace and sculpin species. So this graph on the, the right is showing survival estimates for the fish that we've relocated. As I mentioned, we've done relocation long before this, but starting in 2014, we started looking at survival estimates between fish we re relocate and then fish in our comparison area, which is Upper McGarvey Creek. Upper McGarvey Creek, that reach also has never been observed going dry. But in this area, what we're doing is we're capturing fish, pit tagging them, and just relocating them into the area of capture. So these four years of data, we don't quite have 2021 data yet because our, our survival assessment 
extends all the way till June 30th, and it takes a, a little bit to, to analyze the data, or it takes a little bit of time to do that. But what I have seen from the, the pings or detections we're getting off the antennas is that we had plenty of fish survive from this, this last relocation effort. So seeing this, this pattern for several years now is kind of indicating that we're having good success relocating fish. And also, I don't want to focus on the fish data too much because this is more of a water quality form or that's what K-bump's about, but also that we, we do measure growth and from late summer to the spring out migration period, we're seeing that a very similar pattern with no real difference in growth in the relocated fish. But we did see some differences. Last year was the, the only year I've measured it, but we do see differences in dissolved oxygen and where we measured them in upper, upper McGarvey and then at the, the lower end of the lower most or the downstream BDA, BDA number one. So we are seeing differences in dissolved oxygen. This is from 2021, but once again, it appears not to be really affecting survival in any appreciable way or measurable way. Also, it's since we're in a coastal environment, we don't really deal with higher water temperatures like other areas in the basin. So we don't necessarily have to worry about water temperature. These temperatures aren't anywhere near approaching what would be detrimental to juvenile coho salmon, but I just wanted to kind of, kind of show that. But there was an increase in water temperatures, about two degrees between upper McGarvey Creek and the, the west fork of McGarvey Creek in, the, in that BDA that we created. So that west fork was built, our west fork BDA number one was built in late summer 2019. And then the next year we came in and built a BDA upstream of, of that. And that's when I became concerned we might, might be doing some uh, effects to the DO when we were building this upstream BDA. So that's why I became interested in, in looking at dissolved oxygen in particular. So on the right here is where I hung a DO logger from that pit tag antenna. Those are pit tag antennas. And I hung it eight centimeters from, from the surface. And also why I put it on a pit tag antenna is because we're starting to see quite a bit of evidence of juvenile coho salmon li living in, rearing in areas with low DO, but it's kind of hard to tell if they're actually in that, in that low DO or not. I wanted to actually catch them in the act. And so if I detected them at that, antenna and then I had a DO logger. The idea was that they were indeed rearing in the dissolved oxygen concentrations that I was measuring. And also that I cal calibrated the DO logger several times or all, all my DO loggers, how I calibrate them is by comparing them against a handheld unit. And every time I've done that, the, the readings are, are pretty close definitely within half a milligram per milliliter or less. So why I mentioned that is because I'm fairly, fairly confident that these are, these are fairly accurate readings. Also, that what I'm displaying here is daily mean dissolved oxygen concentrations. Uh, just kind of in a presentation like this, simplify the data I'm displaying. I decided to, to, to do it that way. For better or worse. So here's what we saw in 2020 when we were building that BDA upstream of the area that I measured. And we we're seeing those drops. We actually caused those drops and how we caused them, at least I believe, is from filling up those. These were periods when we had built dams in the BDA upstream and were back flooding. So these areas were back flooding. The flow didn't completely dry up, but it did reduce flow quite a bit. There wasn't a lot of flow. And during these periods, we can see those, those drops in DO. 
you know, also here are these spikes. This is related to, to rainfall events that we had later on in the season. And we can see with just uh, small increases in flow, we're seeing higher dissolved oxygen readings. So what is surprising to me is these drops in DO, since we had a pit tag uh, antennas to look at detections, these are not individual fish, these are number of detections. And what I would have expected to have seen is that we would see drops in the amount of detections during these spikes of fish moving out of the, this area. This, uh, it's not like they were trapped in there. They could have easily moved upstream to areas with, with better DO than what was here, but they didn't. It doesn't seem to have really phased them that much, at least from the pattern I was seeing on the pit tag detections. Then also it's uh, a little more explanation on what's going on here. There are two pit tag antennas in the West Fork downstream of this BDA. And so we can track movement. And th that's exactly what I saw with these increases with, with flow. Coho definitely move and in increases in flow. And that's exactly what happened. Some of these fish are moving out of the BDAs downstream into the West Fork of McGarvey, but we had also pit tagged fish down below the BDAs that were rearing down there. And those fish, at least a portion of them, also moved and they went upstream into the BDA. So we saw this exchange of fish moving both upstream and downstream. And then last year, we didn't have any beaver dam building activity in the West Fork and we don't see those sharp drops in dissolved oxygen. Um, but we do see that there was those increases in dissolved oxygen with uh, rainfall events and, and slight increases in flow. And, and that's at least in this system, what I really kind of saw is that, you know, water turnover rate is driving those, those uh, or the amount of dissolved oxygen that's in those ponds. And also last year, I did spot check measurements. The spot check measurements on the left are of the West Fork of McGarvey Creek upstream of any of the, the BDAs, so upstream of the BDAs in the free flowing section of West Fork of McGarvey Creek. And then as we move to the right, this is uh, moving through the, the ponded habitat until we get to BDA number one, the last measurement that's at that site where those antennas are, and we did the continuous DO logger measurements there. And this wasn't when DO got its lowest. I was waiting until September to, to try to get a measurement of exactly how much oxygen was being taken out of, out of the, the BDAs. And uh, it rained right before I was going to do it, so it kind of blew that, that measurement. But here we can still see. Uh, the effect of water traveling through the BDAs is definitely taking oxygen out of out of the water. And as far as adaptive management, I'm really glad that we did take measurements of dissolved oxygen. It was kind of an afterthought; it wasn't really part of the plan, and it, it really changed how we approached future building of beaver dam analogs in the West Fork. Initially, we were going to put two more BDAs in between BDA number one and BDA number two. But after taking these measurements, I was a little concerned with taking that much dissolved oxygen out of the water. You know, as we reduce the transit time anymore, I'd, I'd assume that the, the dissolved oxygen readings in, in that BDA number one would get, get very low. And once again, this isn't necessarily a problem that these measurements were at the tail end where dissolved oxygen would be the lowest, but we also built this habitat specifically for the most part for the, the purpose of increasing over summer survival during that critical period in late fall, or I mean late summer and early fall. So we these are pretty labor tensions to build, so we'd be reducing our habitat and its usefulness. So in, instead of building those two BDAs in the middle, 
we delayed construction for a season and then moved what would be West Fork BDA number three quite a ways further up in the system. And so we just built that this last year and kind of the, the goal or what I'd like to measure there is how long it takes for the DO to recover. Down, downstream of BDA number one, you, not too far during the low flow period, it goes subsurface. So I do know that it never recovered to something like nine mil milligrams per liter before we ran out of water. Uh, even the, although it got oxygenated from spilling over the dams, it, like I said, never really recovered. I think it got back up to seven before it went subsurface. So upstream at this at this new dam site or this new BDA site, I'd like to see how long it takes to recover. And the, the hope is that as it flows through West Fork BDA number three downstream, that there's enough stream to recover the dissolved oxygen before it goes into West Fork BDA number two. Then also I sh shortened this just to uh, make sure I had enough time. I was hoping that crowd doesn't seem super talkative, but to get some, some interaction, but also I would like to, I know when we started this, I, it's not like I didn't know that this was labor intensive, this hand building of BDAs, but it was much more labor intensive than I expected. And uh, luckily we've got a great crew of people out there helping us with that, especially recently we've hired more people and it's gotten much easier. I know that it was mainly Marshall and I that were constructing that West Fork BDA number two and that was a pretty rough go. We had to work really hard. So now we've got more, more people. It's uh, definitely going a lot better and uh, they're a great group of people to work with and now I'm having a lot of fun out there building this uh, stuff. So it's been a lot of fun and I'd just like to acknowledge all the hard work that, that they've been doing out there. Uh, without them, it would definitely not be possible. And that is all I have. I'm interested in questions. Oh, also, if anyone's interested in looking at some of this stuff, uh, part of the reason why we did this was we can access areas that aren't necessarily accessible by heavy equipment. So just another tool in the quiver for restoration, do, doing stuff where it's not necessarily or it's not conducive to using heavy equipment. So I'd be happy to show any people the work we've been doing. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jimmy, for your presentation, sharing the, your results with us. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking through the questions here. It looks like we've got a question. And um, just a reminder, if anyone else has questions, enter them into the, into the chat or the, or the Q&A. Um, Bill Tenniswood from ODFW asks, was there much aquatic vegetation growth above the BDAs? And maybe just to expand that more generally, how much aquatic vegetation growth is there just all around the BDAs? Yeah, above there, there, and is below? A, there isn't a lot of aquatic vegetation um, in these BDAs. Once they, they flooded, it was almost instant. It looked like it recovered. It got kind of hard to tell, but no. The other thing, I was tempted, but I went through it quick. I must have forgot a lot of stuff. I went through it quicker than, than I thought I would. But the point is, I've got some graphs that I talked to Crystal about that are pretty mysterious. Uh, our swings in DO aren't the typical, you know, lowest right before light. Our swings in DO, it's lowest uh, right around, like right before midnight. So not sure, but anyways, the point is DO is not really driven by aquatic vegetation in the system, which is much different. Okay, um, let me just check from, oh yes, okay, great. <clears throat> uh, Clayton asked, uh, could you comment on the relationship between the lower temperatures in the BDAs and the ability of coho to tolerate and survive lower dissolved oxygen conditions? In other words, do you think that coho would have done okay if you know the temperatures had been a lot higher, whereas you have cool temperatures here? No, I, I don't think as, as we know, 
No. And that's kind of the trap in other areas. The cooler water would be down where the dissolved oxygen is lower. So within these, these BDAs or beaver ponds in general, there is some interesting stuff going on. I, I know we're, we're having an effort to collect more data on this. I was hoping that the Scott River might show some higher water temperatures, but it looked like not speaking for the Scott River Watershed Council, but it seemed like their water temperatures were pretty low too. But no, I think higher temperatures and we would be running into trouble. Another question here from Michael Stapleton. Have you considered putting a solar powered bubbler near the BDAs? I, we have mentioned that, and yes, except for when I really looked in, into it, it's a little more complicated than that. A lot of them, the, the, any, anyhow, I, I, did, I just looked at it briefly. I didn't know how well funders or Green Diamond would really, you know, like us putting, but no, no I've, I've kind of looked into that, but not, not super seriously, but that is a consideration. I mean, uh, not to go over time, but that's kind of the problem around here. And with the over summer habitat, we've got huge beaver ponds down near the estuary and we haven't extensively measured them, but I think that's a major limiting factor. We've got a large amount of habitat that has super low dissolved oxygen. So putting aerators in a lot of places seems like an idea for sure. Yeah, okay, so we'll have to go quick on this one. Uh, follow up to Clayton's question. This is from Chauncey Anderson. Uh, DO solubility is inverse to temperature, so should theoretically be higher at lower temperatures. Is there a lot of organic materials in the pool this, that could be driving sediment oxygen demand, or is the low dissolved oxygen from groundwater coming in, do you think? I, I think it had to do with, especially with the initial flooding, something to do with the, the sediment Although our groundwater in general is very deoxygenated where we've measured it. So yeah. that's when I talked to a smart friend of mine in water quality, he said, I wouldn't try to figure out where the reduction in dissolved oxygen, you know, really chasing that would get difficult. But my guess was there was an initial drop from the sediment for sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Thank so you. we're going to... You know, I have one actual follow up. Um, do you expect to continue this type of monitoring to see if there's any improvements in the future? Oh, yeah, uh, yes. Now I'm pretty hooked on this uh, water quality stuff. So, yeah, for sure. Great.